to the next in a continuing series of uh, webinars delivered by Extension Agribusiness here at NDSU Extension. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an Extension Economist uh, with NDSU, uh, and I'll be moderating it a bit today uh, as we continue. Uh, just some, some background again, so we will be recording this, uh, and we'll post it to uh, the, the Corona Response webpage. Uh, and if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat for this week. Uh, we'll uh, answer those as we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, we will, if you aren't already, we'll make sure that your microphone and camera are off to save bandwidth. Uh, and then finally, again, use the chat for questions. At the end, we will have some, some quick questions for feedback. Uh, one of those is to ask about other areas of interest so we can address them in future webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. So this week, um, I'm going to cover some of the similar topics and just where we updating where we are as far as uh, the macro stuff goes. And so my, my first slide here, uh, one of the things that's been thrown around words like depression versus recession, and I just really quickly wanted to kind of define exactly what the, the, they have very distinct meanings. Um, for instance, uh, uh, but the one, but the one thing about it I want to say is that the difference between a depression and a, re a recession is not really that clearly defined. Okay, recessions have a pretty clear definition. That is two or more quarters in a row of negative growth. Okay, and so they basically end when we when we have positive growth after that, and so they can last quite a while and they can be fairly deep and still not be considered a depression. And as I said, the difference is a little bit subjective. So for instance, the great recession lasted 18 months. It was six quarters. So a year and a half starting around December 7th and ending in uh, the quarter of June, 2009. Then another example is a double dip recession we had in the 1980s. The first recession lasted uh, six months and then then there was another one that lasted 18 months, so about the same time frame as the, the Great Recession, July 81 to November of 82. On the other hand, the Great Depression lasted about 10 years, and it was deep. So not only was it long, but it was deep in terms of the amount of contraction that actually happened. And my next slide kind of highlights some of the differences between uh, recession and depression. And one of the big key factors on a recession versus the outcome of a depression is that depressions, well, we've only had one. So we've kind of got a small sample size as far as that goes. But big structural changes occur as, as a result of a recession. Now people may change, or a, a depression, people may change their behavior somewhat after a recession. And there may be some regulatory changes after a recession. That, for instance, some of the banking regulations that came out of the uh, 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 financial crisis uh, that happened about 10 years ago. On the other hand, with depression, you had things like the SEC being formed. You had the the uh, New Deal from from FDR and his his administration that happened. You had things like Social Security benefits and unemployment benefits and just sweeping changes. And then people that dramatically changed their behavior forever as a result of uh, uh, the depression. So I, I'm certainly not saying we're headed towards any kind of depression or that we're in one because one of the key things about it is it has to be deep in terms of the the big uh, loss to GDP or the loss of jobs and not only does it have to be deep it has to last a long time two or three quarters is not a long time even if it is fairly deep so I just want to make that clear that we're not when when we hear those things in the news that we shouldn't be throwing around words like depression lightly, economic depression lightly, because they have a very they, it's a bit subjective. But the meaning of which it we're really not anywhere in comparison to what it was like in the 30s in terms of how long this lasted. But my next slide does show we are hitting some we've we've hit an unprecedented uh, unemployment um, situation that that hasn't been seen ever. If you look at my uh, graph on the next slide there, it, it shows that we basically had uh, in, in the week ending March 30, 21st, 
we had record unemployment, new unemployment filings, then we beat that best of that record with, again, with 6.87 million. And then the next few weeks, the week after that, it was 6.6 .6 million new filings. And the week following that, 5.24. And then finally, this last week, which ended April 18th, that's when the data ended, we had about 4.43 million new filings. So what we are seeing is that there is a downward trend, at least the last three have been lower than the, than the peak at, at 6.87 million. So while that's still historically high and every single one of these would have been a multifold record for new unemployment filings, it is moving downwards. And so my next slide kind of summarizes some of that stuff. And that is basically that total newly unemployed since the week ending March 21st is 26.43 million new unemployment filings. Some of those folks found jobs. So the continuing jobless claims in the week ending April 11th, which just came out, is about 16 million. So our total unemployment rain remains around 16, 15 and a half to 16 percent. That's where we're sitting right now. That is considerably higher than the height of the Great Recession, which was 9.9% and higher than the double dip recessions in the early 80s, which peaked out around 11%, much lower still than the 1930s. And again, the biggest difference between now and then though is the duration. We were talking about 10 and 11% unemployment for, for months and months and quarters in a row. It remains to be seen how long this will last, uh, the, the unemployment rates that we're sitting at right now, but the sooner we're able to come out of this, the better it's going to be. However, I do not think we are going to go to three and a half percent, which is where we were roughly right before all this happened. I don't think we're going to three and a half percent anytime soon. There are some of these jobs that are just simply not coming back. So another thing I wanted to talk about are home loans. And my next slide kind of shows shows how uh, what's going on with home loans. And I, this, this uh, is some data on home loans that are in forbearance. And if you're not familiar, forbearance, is not like foreclosure. Forbearance is an agreement between the borrower and the lender that payments will be suspended for a period of time. Usually they'll be rolled to the back end of the loan, but interest continues to accrue in most cases if you take out a forbearance. Some people may be familiar with that on like student loans, do the, you would do that same kind of thing. Jeannie May, 8.2, uh, about 3% of Jeannie Mae loan, home loans were in forbearance as of April 12th. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, about almost 5%. Independent, independent mortgage servicers, around 6 Depository services, 65 And then overall, uh, week ending as of April 12th, mortgage forbearance at about 6%. So to put that into perspective, the week ending March 2nd, which was just before things really started to turn uh, for the worse, uh, it was at a quarter percent versus 6%. So it's come up dramatically and this likely will increase as the May 1st payment deadline approaches because most, most mortgages are paid on the first of the month and we'll likely see around May 1st more, more mortgages going into forbearance. So I expect this percentage to go up. Now my next slide, I wanna talk about credit tightening. Uh, these are some headlines that came out of the news. Uh, JP Morgan Chase has stopped accepting HELOC applications. That's home equity lines of credit. They've just stopped accepting them, basically said, do not apply for a HELOC. You're not going to get one. And before that, though, they were up about 33%. So a lot of people trying to borrow against equity in their home to make ends meet or get some cash, uh, free of some cash for living. And then Fannie and Freddie has been announced they may start buying home loans in forbearance to help these mortgage firms out. So if you don't know, Fannie and Freddie are government backed since the financial crisis. And so they can buy up some of these loans and be backed by uh, possibly the Federal Reserve or other entities. Okay, so continuing with the credit tightening on my next slide, here's some things that uh, information on, on lending. JP Morgan Chase from Tuesday, customers applying for new mortgages will need a higher credit score. It used to be around 620 or 610 was the minimum. Now at least 700 and you have to put 20% down. And then across the country, uh, the percentage of conventional loans has dropped dropped almost 25% in March, jumbo loan availability almost 37%, jumbo loans are just over $500,000 versus a conventional. And then USDA and VA, FHA, so government-backed home loans down about 7%. Then my next slide I wanna talk about real quick on pending home sales. 
So mortgage applications to new purchases down 31% from this time a year ago. And the 30, despite the 30 year fixed rate at three and a half percent, which is the lowest since it's been being tracked. So in other words, interest rates are really low, but folks are not buying new homes. Now refinance demand is up 225%, which makes sense because people are refinancing and taking advantage of these low rates, but new home purchases down quite a bit. Uh, signed new contracts, which is tracked from Zillow. This is not, they haven't been closed on, but they've signed a contract to either uh, once, once a home is sold, they move in or some contingent contract. It's down 32% from a year ago. So it is being felt and we haven't, this data remember is backward looking. So we're a few weeks, the last couple of weeks are not included in this data, which I expect will show further weakness in new home purchases and the availability of home loans. Meanwhile, people who are able are taking advantage of, of the uh, low rates. So finally, I wanted to end on a little bit of good news. And as I said before, new unemployment filings are, are decelerating. They're still just astronomically high, but at least they're not increasing. So hopefully that show, and, and the other thing is when you look at the long-term unemployment, or the multi, multi, uh, multiple week filings or multiple month filings, that, that is not as high as the number of people who applied. So some of these folks have found some jobs or, or for other reasons aren't needing it. So that, that's a good sign. New unemployment filings, again, decelerating. Hopefully that trend continues that, and, and probably a lot of that is because the segment of society that, that was impacted has pretty much not gone back to work. They've all been able to get in and get filed. And so we're, they're just uh, waiting for their, their job opportunities to open up. Low interest rates should persist for the foreseeable future. I cannot imagine a scenario in the next couple of quarters, two or three, where interest rates move upward at all. Probably gonna last longer than that because I expect this recovery is gonna take a while to be fully recovered. And then markets have rebounded some. If you look at the equities markets, it's it's not it's well off the lows from a few weeks ago. Consumer sentiment is not great, but it's still better than it was six, uh, six or eight years ago. So there's been some improvement and a lot of that has to do with the hopes on the fact that the, uh, the that some of these state economies are gonna open that we're gonna go back to some semblance of normal, whatever that normal looks like, I, I have no idea and I don't think anyone else does either, but that's that's basically where we're at right now. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker, which is uh, uh, Frayne Olson. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Frayne Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, I'm going to try and springboard off of a few things that, that Brian has introduced or, or brought to forefront. Uh, one of the most common questions I've been getting over the last week or so has been uh, almost everybody I talked to said, well, so when do we think the lows will be in, in the grain markets? You know, when, when do we know that kind of those lows have been set and we may be able to start rebounding or start rebuilding from there? And it, obviously nobody knows for sure. Um, we're still getting minute by minute new news about what's going on in the marketplace. And so, you know, this is, this is not an exact science. But I do want to take a, a, a little bit of a review, some of the techniques or tools that, that market analysts and traders use to try and get a handle on, again, price movements or price trends in the marketplace. Um, most of the time I talk about the supply demand conditions, the fundamentals. Um, today, I'm going to take a little different tact and, and talk about a couple of the technical anal analysis tools or charting tools that we have in our toolbox that also may be able to provide some information and help uh, help make better marketing decisions. So on the, my first slide, I just try and provide a, a really quick definition of what is technical analysis or a charting tool. What we're doing is we're using, we're looking at historical price movements. We're looking at primarily the futures market looking backwards and saying, do we see some trends? Are there, are there some common themes that, or some common patterns that appear that we can use to try and evaluate where prices may move, be moving in the future? Now, technical analysis does not directly consider supply and demand conditions. So a, a pure technical analyst only looks at the price movements. They're not really concerned about supply and demand. In reality, a lot of the, the professional traders follow both. They, they look at the supply demand conditions, but they also look at what's happening on the charts. And, and between the two of them, they try and form opinions about what they think the futures will, will bring. So it is common. It's a tool that's commonly used for traders and analysts. 
I want to emphasize most of the time we use this to for for price, short term price trends. We're really looking in the next week, maybe two weeks, kind of looking forward. What do we see as the as the current current trends right now? Do we expect 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 those trends to continue in the short run? So from a timing standpoint, think of maybe one week, possibly two weeks into the future. Okay, and again, we're looking for these turning points. If, if, if prices are trending downward or prices are trending upward, it's pretty easy to follow that trend. What everybody is, is usually trying to ask is, so when are we gonna see that shift? When is the low gonna be put in and it starts to rebuild? Or when are we expecting a higher in the market and, and expecting it to turn down? Um, this is also one of the primary tools used by the hedge fund managers and the index fund uh, traders. So uh, again, these are used by a broad base across the futures market. Um, and again, it provides some insights into the market psychology, kind of, you know, again, what are the attitudes, what are the perceptions, what are some of the key pricing points? So I'm going to start with corn. My first slide is, is looking at what, what's called the relative strength index or RSI. You can see in the top half of the chart, it's the futures market, uh, um, historical futures market trends. On the bottom, the blue line is the one that I'm going to talk about. Uh, now, again, I pulled these charts last night after the markets closed. So this morning I do have some, a little bit of updated information and I'll try and talk about that as well. But if you look at the black line, you can see that in corn, this is the May corn market, which would be for old crop corn. Uh, new crop corn, November is gonna look very, very similar. You can see the definitive downward trend. And so the question everybody has is, well, given that spike down to about $3 in the futures market with a quick rebound, is that signaling that we're in a low? And one of the techniques we use is, is again, this RSI, Relative Strength Index. This is a measure, or used as a measure of overbought versus oversold. So it's a ratio, it's a relationship between the number of up days we've had in the marketplace versus the number of down days we've had in the market, uh, in the market looking backwards again. Um, if in, on the top, 50% is or 50 is considered to be neutral or, or a ratio of, of 50 is considered to be neutral. Up days, down days are about equal. When we get to the that upper blue line, which is uh, denoted by that, that line at 70, that's considered to be um, overbought, meaning that the buying, buying pressure is really re reaching an extreme level relative to the selling pressure. On the bottom side, a 30, um, a, a ratio of about 30 is considered to be over, uh, oversold. And as you notice uh, that the, the blue bar, the calculation, has is, is been hovering around that 30 mark for quite some time. And if you look back um, in that August to September time period, you notice we have a, a, a gap or a range that would be very similar. So what this is signaling to me is that we, are, we have been in an oversold market for a while now, that the selling pressure has been pretty, pretty intensive, it doesn't yet look like that, that, that particular indicator is starting to turn up yet. We need to have a little bit more of a rise over several days to be able to turn that, that heavy blue line upwards to signal that yes, we're, we're now in an upward moving market where this oversold pressure is starting to be released. The next slide to look at it, the same information a little bit differently is the MACD. It's moving average convergence divergence. It's, it's basically a measure of not only price direction, but also um, the, how, how, um, how rapidly is it changing? So it's looking more at momentum in the marketplace. Is, we know that prices have been moving downwards, but is that a strong downward push or is the momentum starting to wane? And again, we're looking at the relationship between two moving averages, which is the blue line and the, and the green line. I really wanna focus on those red bars, those, the histogram part. If, if the bars are below zero, it shows that we're in a downtrend. The height of the bars, whether if they're a really big bar or a small bar, indicates how rapidly is the market changing? What is the market momentum? So as you can see right now today that the, the downward pressure has been pretty, pretty fast, pretty rapid, but it looks like that downward pressure is starting to wane, that it's starting to stabilize a little bit. So this MACD indicator is telling us that this downward pressure may be waning a bit, and as I look at the numbers today, it looks like, again, it's kind of flattening out. So the question is, are we gonna to start to, is this a turning point? Are we gonna to start to turn positive where we see some upward movement? Or are we gonna be in kind of a holding pattern here for a few more days or into next week? On the next slide, the, the, again, the question that a lot of people ask is, well, if we've seen these, these this dips, if we're looking at a low, how high will prices recover before we start running into, into pressure? And again, this is a technique that I talked about a little bit earlier in previous recordings. 
These are support and resistance levels. So I'm just looking for price levels where prices have spiked down and then returned up or spiked up and then fallen down lower. And I put in those lines. Again, this is a bit subjective. Um, I guess in my viewpoint, you know, that $3 low that we put in recently that where it spiked down and rebounded, um, that low was, was a long-term low. We had seen that a few times in the past, uh, once back in 2016 and again another time in 2009, that $3 price level seemed to be a, a really critical, what we call a support level where, where prices will stop falling. Now the question is, if we're moving upwards, where's the first resistance level? And if you look at the charting techniques, that 335 looks like the first major resistance level. So the question is, if prices start to rise, is there enough upward momentum? Is the new information in the market strong enough to convince the, the buyers that a price above 335 would be a good value? And again, we, we really don't know, but psychologically, 335 is going to be that first test, that first first kind of barrier to say, is this recovery uh, a weak recovery or is this strong enough to be able to really move prices higher? On the next slide, we do the basically the same thing only for soybeans. Um, if we look at the, this RSI or this oversold versus overbought ratio, um, it's, it looks as though it's still an oversold mode, but not quite as oversold or not quite as negative as it was for the corn market. Um, it, again, it looks as though that, that, that RSI that, that is starting to hook upwards, which again would, would signal that maybe this oversold position might be starting to reverse or come back to, to a higher level. The next slide, if we look at the MACD, um, again, the MACD, it, it, what this is signaling to me, if you look at those, those red bars, is that we have been a pretty aggressive downward trend. The downward trend still seems to be holding, but it's obviously weakening considerably. So that downward momentum has really started to slow. And if I look at today's numbers, um, the downward trend is, is still there, uh, but it's, it's again slowing. Um, it's it's kind of questionable in the, in the soybean market whether we could really consider this a low. And again, if you look back uh, into that uh, uh, mid-May time period, or March time period, excuse me, um, we did see some prices that are on average a little bit lower than what we see today. When we look at those resistance, support and resistance levels, which is the next slide, um, we see that that really that first, uh, if, if, if this is a corner and we start to see some increasing prices, 870 on the May futures is really that first benchmark that we're looking at to say, is this rally got enough momentum to really push things upward or is this just a slight updraft that we're seeing on a more of a short term basis? On the next slide, we look at the RSI for spring wheat. This is again, May spring wheat. Um, this one is signaling at least it looks as though the, the, the downward pressure on, on wheat prices, spring wheat prices, at least right now, it looks like that will continue. We're not at that 30% level, but we're drifting in that direction. But again, the trend line or the kind of the, the movement for this overbought, oversold indicator is that we still have a lot of selling pressure going on, which would push prices lower. If you look at the MACD, we look at the momentum in the marketplace. Again, those red bars are below the zero mark, so it's showing that we are in a downward trend. That downward trend seems to have pretty good momentum yet, um, and it may take a while before we actually see, again, a bottom start to form in the spring wheat market. If we look at where the next slide, at the, where are the support and resistance levels, um, you'll see that we're right now touching some of those key levels at about $5. Um, the futures market right now is trading at 4.99 and a quarter for May. So I, I'm really hoping by the end of the time period here, or by the end of the close today, that we're going to be in a position where that $5 uh, psychological support will maintain and will hold. And again, hopefully we'll be able to, that will be the bottom and then we'll be able to start moving prices upwards from there. So I just wanted to provide a very quick summary of some of the, 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 and analytical tools that are used by a lot of the market traders to get an idea of not only overbought, oversold, what's the momentum in the marketplace, and then more importantly, what are some key pricing points that, that uh, you need to be looking for for either support or resistance. So with that, I'll turn things over to Tim Petrie, or to Ron Haugen, excuse me. Good afternoon. Uh, my, my name is Ron Haugen, I'm Extension Farm Management with NDSU. And I was going to touch on some legislation uh, that's uh, that's ongoing. Um, 
I'm just going to talk a little bit, of, uh, give you an outline of the agriculture appropriation from the CARES Act. Uh, we have a kind of an outline on that. This information has been out for a, a week or so now, but I just wanted to give you an outline of, of wh where it is. And also, uh, there was some legislation that was signed into law this morning, and I was going to touch on that. So my first slide shows uh, shows a couple pie charts here, and there was 19 billion that was authorized um, in that. And this program is called the uh, Coronavirus Food uh, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. There's always acronyms, and of that 19 billion, three billion was supposed to be used for uh, product purchases. And the rest they're calling direct payments. And that other pie chart shows the breakdown of the direct payments. And they're gonna be by commodity and cattle, 5.1 billion, uh, row crops, 3.9. Those are the two highest. Now they call it row crops, but that includes wheat and, and, and other types of crops as well. Um, uh, dairy, 2.9, hogs, 1.6 other specialty crops, 2.1, and then there's a little slice of the pie that's, uh, that's a half a billion. Now, the USDA has authority to, uh, if, if part, of, part of those pieces of the pie aren't, the, the money isn't used as much, they can move it over to other, par other pieces or other commodities if there's a bigger demand and other, other pieces of that pie. So, next, <clears throat> I was going to talk about uh, there, okay, one thing I wanted to mention. There was no line items for lamb or sheep or horticulture. Uh, they were they were talked about when the when the bill was dis, bill was uh, debated, but they didn't show up here. Uh, so I just want to make a note of that. Uh, in regard to that three billion of product purchases, the plan is to for the government to purchase one hundred million uh, one hundred million uh, uh, dollars per month of fruits and vegetables, $100 million per month of dairy products, and $100 million per month of meat uh, in continue, continuing until they use, uh, use that up that $3 billion uh, that was planned. Next, <clears throat> uh, here's a chart that I actually got from Farm Bureau that it looks like a pretty busy chart, but it's kind of an interesting and uh, interesting chart to look at. Uh, this is the impact on, uh, from the COVID on the various commodities. And, it, and you can see there that hogs took, has taken the biggest hit, uh, minus uh, 53%. Wheat is, is, the, is the least hit, uh, minus 4%. Uh, most, most of the commodities are around that 20% mark. Ethanol, not very good either, minus 33%. Uh, so those, that shows you the impact on the prices of the various commodities. And I'm sure uh, uh, when we get to the direct payments, they're gonna use some of this data. The next slide, um, uh, it, I'm going to talk about the, the calculations and how these direct payments are, are going to be done. The producers will receive a single payment using two calculations. So the first part of the calculation, uh, the, the price losses that occurred between January 1st and April 15th, uh, and, that's, and that's a little easier to define because uh, that's history. Um, uh, producers will be compensated by commodity for 85% of that price loss. The second part of the payment will be the expected losses. Now this is where we're projecting losses here uh, from April 15th through the next two quarters. And 30% and of those expected losses will be, will be a part, a part of this, this payment. So there's still some question marks on, on what uh, what price data we use and, and, and the, the data set that's be used to calculate this information. Next, um, there, is a, there is a payment limit, however, uh, of 125,000 per commodity, and there's an overall limit of 250,000 per individual or entity. Now, the, 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 the qualified commodities must, must have experienced at least a 5% price increase between January and April. Now the bill, uh, the, 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 the outline here has to be reviewed by OMB. They've got the outline uh, and, and that takes a while. And then after that, the USDA expects to expects sign up for the new program in early May, which is getting very close, early May, uh, and, and try to get the payments to producers by the end of May 
or early Ju June. I'm I'm predicting early June. It seems like it always takes them a little longer than than they than they project. Next, <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to talk about is the the CARES supplemental legislation that was passed. Uh, the, the technical name for that is the Paycheck uh, Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act. And what they did, they prop, propped in some more money into the, in, into the CARES Act. And so that $349 billion of the PPP program that ran out of money, they put in another $310 billion. They replenished that. But there was a stipulation of that $310, $60 billion must go to small lenders, in effect, Smaller lenders, they're assuming, I guess, lend to smaller businesses. So some of these mom and pop businesses that got shorted last time when the big dogs took most of the money, uh, hopefully they can get the funding and hopefully the funding will go to the, to the people that really need it. Um, and they also had some clarification language and I'll just read this to you, it's right there in the yellow. The SBA uh, uh, clarified that it, when you make the certification on this, on this loan, borrowers must take into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support an ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. And what, what that big sentence is saying is that if you can get loans from other sources uh, and, and, and if you really don't need this loan, you really shouldn't be applying. And I think the first go around, there was a lot of people that may, not, may have not needed those loans that, 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 that got the money. The next part of this uh, uh, supplemental act uh, was, was the 500, bill, uh, 500 billion that went into the, to the idle, the, the, the economic injury disaster loan from SBA. And those have always been around, those, those idle loans. And uh, th those are for any uh, SBA borrower and now, and now anyone uh, it, with economic injury can apply. And there was another 10 billion into that idle, idle grants, they call it. And that is actually um, a, a $10,000 uh, $10, grants that you can just get, okay? Now, as for farmers and ranchers, uh, they finally made it clear that it's okay for farmers and ranchers to apply for those uh, uh, EIDL loans. Uh, and it, they also stipulated that you can get uh, money from PPP and, and the EIDL as well. Now at this point now, there is no tie between the other government programs like ARC PLC and any of these other programs. Uh, also within this act, uh, there was 75 billion for hospitals and which, which were b badly, b badly uh, needed and uh, 25 billion for testing as well, which is badly needed. Um, so with that, that's kind of a summary of the legislation that was signed into law this morning. And next, I'll turn it over to Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, my first slide, uh, and uh, I'm just going to repeat. This is Ron. Yeah, this is Ron's slide, so I'm not going to repeat it. But you know, everybody's wondering. Do we qualify for the five percent? It was our five percent loss. What's going to be paid? So on. So go to the next one. I'll try to cover that a little bit. Nobody knows what data set USDA is going to use. As Ron said, I'm just doing some guideline here, kind of some cowboy arithmetic to kind of give you some uh, guidelines. Um, USDA does have a lot of data sets, and we assume that they're going to use their own price data set to determine losses that you won't have to say, okay, on January 1st, my auction market or wherever you sell, depends on the type of livestock you had, had this price, and then I sold whatever, a month later, and you, and you may well have to prove that you sold uh, livestock, but most likely it will be based on a USDA data set, but that isn't for sure anyway. So just some guidelines here, start in the upper left, slaughter steer prices, USDA uh, tracks, and they even forecast into the future of what the five market area fed steer prices will 
will be. And then here in the blue line is the history on that. Uh, these are weekly here, but the week of January 1st, we started off at 124.21. April 15th ended up at 102.28. So there was a 21.93 decline, which is more than the 5%. And again, the payment as Ron said is based on 85%. So I don't know how much money they're gonna have and if they run out of money, but you know, there's an 1864 per hundred weight on fed cattle, which uh, runs into money in a hurry. And then uh, for feedlots over 500 to 600 head sold, they're gonna hit the limitation. But anyway, you know, there has been some variation in prices there. So you go back there to the uh, end of March, beginning April, prices did spike up. And so if you sold on that week, does that mean that they're gonna take uh, the higher price off from what it was January 1st. I, I don't know, or, you know, they could just say, we pay everybody the average that it went down. That's all to be determined. No one knows, and, and we'll have to wait a couple weeks for that. Go to the slide, no, just stay on this one. Excuse me, but yeah, no, go, yeah, just go to the right. To the right is the five to 600 pound steers. And again, here I'm using uh, USDA, uh, Agricultural Marketing Service data from the Southern Plains because USDA does like to use Oklahoma City as a base point for feeder cattle prices. Whether they're going to do that or not, I don't know, but this shows you, you know, would be a proxy what 550 or 500 to 600 pound calves have done. This is the Southern Plains. Again, you see they generally went up in January and February because that's the seasonal pattern for light calves with the demand for grass cattle. So, you know, there weren't any damages really occurred there until March and then they fell out of bed, but then came back in April a little bit and settled. And so if you strictly go from January 1st until April 15th, it is about a ten and a half dollar per hundred weight loss there times 85 is about uh, nine dollars. Down in the bottom then to the left is the heavier weight yearling steers have generally went down the entire time. They did come back right at the first of April at an at a nice jump and they did that in North Dakota as well and then they backed off uh, and about to, for the entire time period again I'm not sure if they're gonna want receipts of when you sold and then take that day on their price data and and determine how that changed from January 1st but about a 21 and on the cow side there's a lot of different cow market classes you know from cutter to canter and everything else and uh, this is just one, again, the Southern Plains for the lean, 85 to 90% lean, these would be more cow cows that actually are higher now. I didn't even compute it because you have to show a 5% loss and there's on this chart, at least there uh, wasn't one of them. The big question obviously is the intent of the rule, I think, was to provide money for cow calf producers for cows, even though you hadn't sold anything, but uh, how do you measure that? And so that USDA will have to determine if they're gonna pay on cows and I assume they are but that may not be valid and and uh, and determine how to pay that because you know we're, cows are calving so we're not uh, selling them this one here would be called cows and not sure they'd even pay on slaughter cow prices even though it's a market class so go to the next slide please and uh, here uh, you know another thing the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has a feeder cattle index and this is all seven to basically 900 medium and large one and two steers sold by all the markets reported by USDA. I've talked about it before, you know, four of them in North Dakota and 20 some in South Dakota and, and all, all down all through Texas and everything else. And so uh, then I'll show you the spreadsheet in a minute, but the CME comes up with every day what uh, the CME feeder cattle index, a proxy of the cash market. And this is what the, the futures are settled out on. There's no delivery on a futures contract. So this is what the feeder cattle futures would be settled out. So it's a proxy for the cash market. You know, it shows I bought the identical thing that I showed in the previous chart for, for the seven to eight. And this is seven to nine of about a, after the 85% about a 21. So go to the next slide. 
And uh, here is the April futures contract then with that cash settlement price shown on there. And I uh, just have highlighted on the right hand side in red there to show you that we have kind of found a trading range here after a hitting a bottom in early April and all the volatility we had there from uh, about the second week in March all the way, all the way through March. And, part way into April is just limit down or limit up and advance. So we have traded, you know, more in what would be a normal trading range, which, you know, uh, makes us feel a little better, I guess, although it's quite a bit lower than, you know, when we were up there at 150 back in February when things were going great guns. So on the next slide, uh, you know, people continuously ask me of, you know, where is that CME spreadsheet and how do they do it? And so this is the one from April 15th, which was the last day of the period. And so this comes, a new one comes on uh, CME, just go to the CME or Google uh, CME Peter Cattle Index and you got to go through a couple buttons there to get to the spreadsheet, but it's all transparent. There's nothing hidden as some people think that they try to maneuver this. It's actual markets with actual number of head they sold in the weight and the price. They average it up for that day on the bottom on the 15th, the average was 118.38, but then it's a seven day moving average. So every day they add a, the new date and drop off the previous seventh one. So the average was a 114.56, which happened to be kind of a low of, of that entire period. So go to the next slide uh, and uh, Wanted to just mention a little bit about uh, how we're pulling back on 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 uh, slaughter and uh, a lot of numbers here that I'm not going to go through. Uh, USD and these aren't real numbers; these are estimates, and it takes a couple weeks for them to check all the the meat inspectors to see exactly how many went through. But we are definitely pulling back on slaughter of everything. And, uh, you know, starting with cattle there, today's estimate was to kill about 84,000. And last year we'd have killed 121,000. And so, uh, you know, we're way off. And and on the bottom then is the same for the, the uh, period to all Monday through Thursday compared to last week. And, you know, we're off 138,000 there and then go to hog, hog, skip calves and go to hogs there. Again, we're really, really off on hogs about already down about 300,000 this week from last year. And we've got a record. Of, we got quite a few more hogs this year that we needed to kill. And so really, really backing up there. And just uh, someone asked uh, on the chat, I think, of what's been hurt worse. And hog prices have been hurt the worst simply because we got a lot of them and we're backing off slaughter uh, more on them. And, 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 and Ron's chart showed that too on the pictures that they, they have been affected the worst. Go to the next slide here and uh, on the feeder cattle side then uh, we did have fewer feeder cattle around at the beginning of the year because we had a lower calf crop last year so we're expecting a few less auction receipts and that was the case but then again when uh, the middle of March hit and the prices collapsed the people didn't sell and held, held back a lot so we really took receipts off and then they did pick up back up into April uh, some and now again it backed off. So the last month or so and more on that in a minute, but we have backed off feeder cattle receipts. So go to the next slide. Uh, the uh, Today at two o'clock, which is not far away, there's going to be a new cattle on feed report comes out and these then are how many cattle were placed in March, how many were sold in March, and then on April 1st, how many cattle did we have on feed. And so this is just an estimate that Erner Berry uh, puts out. The re actual report will come out so you can check on it. But as you see there uh, in the top middle column there on a place that were the, the average of what the estimates are, are to be about 18% down on placements and about 12% higher on market so we marketed a lot in March and we placed a lot less so that's one of the reasons why we are still able to merchandise feeder cattle in North Dakota at at least for the given the circumstances somewhat respectable prices because feedlots 
are down. Our, our cattle on feed probably be 95%. And again, two o'clock, you'll find out on the bottom then, here are some of the people that are questioned and to make up the average. And you see in the highlight there, North Dakota State University is one of the participants. Uh, you ask who that is. If these estimates, uh, that NDSU makes are close, I made them. If they're a long ways off, Frayne made them. So go to the next slide. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, we are marketing cattle uh, at the, uh, the auctions reported by Agricultural Marketing Service in North Dakota this week. We sold uh, 5,668 compared to 3,370 last week. So sold a couple thousand more. So they're moving. And I just highlighted the 750 to 8 because that's what I've been talking about every uh, every time here, you know, right in there, that mid 135 last week and about the same prices this week. So cattle are, uh, the good news is we can still, still sell cattle and there's a demand. Feedlots in Nebraska have high moisture corn, like I've said before. So uh, I think that's my last slide. And if so, uh, go ahead to Dave. Uh, great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy uh, Economic Specialist at NDSU Extension. Uh, just some, some general quick comments, although I could speak at length uh, on what's going on in the, in the oil market specifically. Uh, ethanol, uh, looking for like silver lining or that good news that Brian was kind of alluding to, uh, the, eth the corn ethanol industry in the U.S. is actually really getting really close to equilibrium, uh, which would I kind of say is like we're getting to the end of the beginning uh, in terms of the the response uh, in that industry to uh, COVID uh, and declining uh, gasoline use primarily. Uh, biggest news in the last week or so, it actually came out yesterday, is that ADM is going to uh, temporarily idle. Uh, very, very large corn ethanol plants, uh, one in Columbus, Nebraska, one in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, each are over 300 million gallon uh, capacity facilities. Uh, so to combine, they're about three and a half percent of national capacity. Uh, ADM says they expect that they'll be offline for about four months, uh, which given where we were uh, bef before this, will actually be a little bit short on production relative to use, which is a good thing because there's stocks to use up. Um, in terms of oil, I'm sure that, that most of you have probably caught wind uh, to some extent of what happened on Monday, uh, the last trading day of the, the May crude oil contract and going not only into uh, a place where the price was negative, but substantially negative, uh, which occurred for a number of reasons. I'll just touch on a little bit briefly. Uh, on the fundamental side, this uh, this imbalance between uh, production and use, primarily petroleum, is really looming large, and we're getting closer and closer to that point where uh, the lack of working space will dramatically impact uh, the, the oil markets. A lot of folks thought on Monday that that was being driven primarily by fundamentals, and maybe at the start of the day it was, but but it was more of a, a poker game uh, and, and a standoff as, as those prices started to decline and not really connected to fundamentals later. Uh, probably one of the biggest things to look at right now is this breakdown uh, among these price relationships within the, the petroleum complex, you know, crude prices uh, across the, the country, uh, crude versus refined products, uh, and it's really... Uh, starting to come to a head and kind of showing that, that, that these storage issues and these the, these local supply and demand issues are really starting to, to, to impact the market. Uh, first slide I have is just showing ethanol days in storage. And if you can actually see this last week, and these are numbers from EIA through last Friday, so a little bit dated, we actually had a decline in the number of days of storage from about 54 days to 53 days, which is still near a record. Uh, 54 was the record, but it shows we're kind of going in, in, the, in the right direction. Uh, we had production fall a bit and we had use rise a bit and it you know ended up uh, impacting days in storage clearly a long ways to go before uh, we eat through that 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 excess supply what's in stock uh, but with ADM's announcement you know we're much closer to that and in, in, in that space than we were uh, yesterday before they made the announcement uh, just to talk a little bit about the, what happened on Monday with the made May crude uh, futures uh, contract there are bearish fundamentals going on clearly. Uh, weak demand, uh, lower gasoline use, lower diesel use now is definitely coming on board uh, or is expected relative to what it was a few weeks ago. Uh, and then obviously these storage concerned. And so there were a lot of bearish, there's a lot of bearish sentiment in the market. Uh, but for, for the most part, what happened was uh, it, 
and we, we I, I don't know if I've ever seen one before, but this is essentially a long squeeze, the opposite of a short squeeze. There were a lot of folks uh, who were bullish, thought the prices had gone too low, uh, had taken a long position, primarily using an ETF, which is kind of unique. Historically, we, you know, these types of instruments didn't exist. A uh, uh, lot of long positions, the ETF, uh, there's about three of them. They simply didn't unwind fast enough and were stuck on Monday uh, needing to get out of those positions because clearly they had no interest in uh, getting into the physical market. Uh, and that led to these dramatic declines in prices. Uh, that did uh, uh, reverberate throughout the, the market. Again, it was, uh, you know, futures are supposed to be somewhat helpful in terming as a hedging tool and understanding, uh, you know, or providing some light or shedding some light on what's going on uh, in other markets. And that it obviously broke down severely on, on Monday, and it's still a little bit shaky now. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, focusing just a little bit on storage uh, and on Cushing, Oklahoma. So Cushing is... Uh, in some respects, in the middle of nowhere, uh, but it's also the the, the hub of the, the U.S. oil industry. At least that's where WTI is priced. And so Cushing is really just this location with a number of pipelines crossing and and a few tanks. Uh, but it it, it is uh, you know kind of this middle ground uh, between a lot of markets and, and the movement of of oil uh, from Texas, Oklahoma, and elsewhere to the Gulf and refining. Uh, what we saw last week was a. a Again, this continued buildup in storage, uh, going from uh, about 60%, excuse me, about 70% storage now to 76% of the working capacities taken up. About 5 million uh, barrels uh, of, of working storage and Cushing have filled, which means we're getting really, really close to that area where there's not enough uh, space to work. Uh, new analogy, uh, just talking about how it's, it, you know, you don't have to hit 100% before you're really in trouble. Uh, Sunday afternoon, I made burgers for the kids. My three-year-old daughter took a giant bite out of her hamburger uh, and couldn't chew. And of course, that's just this, an analogy for this. It's like, you know, we don't have to get to 100% before we're in trouble. You know, we're already in that zone where the ability to, to move uh, oil, uh, you know, within the pipelines, uh, you know, to utilize all the, all the tankage is, is really getting limited. And, and Cushing is the, the, at the far extreme of this. If we look nationally, there's, there's a lot of places – uh, a lot of other markets, especially at the pad level, where there's there, there's there's enough space, uh, but Cushing here it's it, it's really coming to a head quickly. Uh, not enough to, to 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 support what actually happened on Monday, but this is one of those uh, fundamental or logistics issues, which is which is definitely driving the market and has clearly now uh, gotten the attention of a lot of folks. Uh, one of the big things I want to talk about, and it's really important here with North Dakota being a, an oil state is that we've really seen a breakdown in the, the pricing relationships that existed uh, even to and through Monday morning. Uh, and so typically, you know, we do have these relationships a spread between different uh, physical commodities uh, or between futures and, and, and spot prices. For the most part, that's, that's really broken down. Uh, you know, between WTI futures and WTI spot, you know, that, that relationship is kind of decoupled. The relationship between WTI and other domestic crude has really broken down. Uh, we can see that with the prices that we've seen here uh, in, in the Northern Plains in North Dakota and Montana. Um, uh, CHS Billings has been, been quoting oil at basically a dollar for a week now, uh, which is, and has not moved in, in any relationship with WTI, which again is that North American benchmark. Then finally, you know, talking about North Dakota, we saw uh, North Dakota Light Sweet was negative uh, at the end of business on Monday. Uh, Rose to a dollar on, on on Tuesday, then four fifty uh, four twenty five on Wednesday, and then seven fifty yesterday. But again, not really moving in tandem with WTI, which would typically be the case. Uh, and that's just one example of, of the many uh, types of crude traded in North America, other than uh, the, the W than that other than that West Texas uh, blend. You know, at the same time too, we've seen a big change in the in the crack spread, the difference between crude oil prices and that of gasoline and diesel. Uh, you know, up here, we, we've seen a dramatic decline in, in, in oil prices. Uh, but it, it, up until this week, it really hasn't been a, a strong relationship what we're seeing at the rack. Uh, the last 10 days, we've actually seen gasoline prices here in Montana and the Dakotas as low as 10 cents a gallon, uh, which we're not seeing at, at the pump. But again, there's, there's this continuing disconnect as refiners are trying to figure out if and how they can do business uh, and how they're going to, to, to 
to market and move their, their refined products to market. Uh, again, a, a really big concern. Uh, you know, right now, there's been a lot of sentiment in the market that, you know, right now, a lot of the, the shale players are simply going to be out of the money and, and not be profitable for quite some time. And that is driven in, in large part from these larger fundamentals, but also with these, these local uh, supply and demand imbalances. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll turn over to, to questions here pretty quick. I, I will make a quick plug for a, a, a webinar series that is uh, being delivered by NDSU Extension in partnership with USDA FSA. Uh, we're having the last webinar this Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday on the 29th at 11 a.m. We're going to talk about ARC PLC uh, and, and, and some other related issues. Uh, with that, you can visit our farm management webpage to register and join. And we do have recordings of the two previous webinars online right now. Um, with that, I think we'll, we'll move into some questions. And the first one I'll do is, is John, to use the, the Q&A tool with Zoom. And he asked, will cow calf producers that calve in the spring and sell calves in, their, in the late fall be left out of these payments, out of these CFAT payments? Okay, uh, this is Tim. Uh, very good question. The intent of the, I think the congressional intent was to provide money for uh, cow calf producers. How that's going to be done, I don't know, but the intent certainly was there. And uh, how USDA is going to come up with that, I don't know. But there was an intent to provide relief for cow calf producers, but it didn't show up in the in in just the the sketchy things that we got. It was more on that they had to show a, uh, at least a five percent market loss. So um, really, no answer there. But the intent was to provide money to them. Right. And there's uh, thanks, another Tim. one while I. Yep. There's another one about uh, how will kill plants catch up, and the answer to that is it's very difficult for them to catch up because uh, more and more plants are having trouble. But you know, thank goodness uh, Dakota City plant uh, for cattle is still going, and it's, it ends up kind of being a regional thing. The, we said before the hog industry has really, really been hurt, and in our area up here, we're really, really hurt because our two closest plants in Sioux Falls and in Worthington are both closed down. So, you know, no bids for hogs up here. So while in the Eastern Corn Belt, they're still going and, and have plants, but you know, every day there's more announcements, but gonna be very, very difficult to catch up. It'll be a long-term backlog because we, you know, we had a record amount of hogs ready to kill and, and we're not doing that. Great, thanks Tim. I, I think a question for Frame. Uh, any new information on MFP3? Uh, how would it be implemented and how would farmers qualify in 2020? Um, there's likely not be a, w w what's formally called an MFP3. Um, the market facilitation program was really targeting financial losses due to the U.S.-China trade war. Um, and now everything has been switched over really into trying to measure or capture or, or support uh, economic losses due to the, the COVID-19. And so... Uh, I, I think kind of the, the common lingo is that this MFP3 payment or this next round of financial support, even though it's not tied to the U.S.-China trade agreement, is really the, the material that, that Ron was trying to cover, and, and we're still a little bit fuzzy on what those payments might look like. So, uh, again, I think it's a, it's a terminology thing, but the, this, this new CARES Act and the support that's coming from um, from that for farmers is we're, we're keeping an eye on it. And that's really what, what a lot of what Ron was trying and as well as Tim was trying to support. Now in, in some private conversations with some other, uh, I guess, leaders in the ag policy area, um, there's been indications that this, this, this is just a first round that the material or the funding in this cares act is really just the first round of multiple rounds of support. So, Again, keep your eyes and ears open. We'll have to wait to see how this plays out. Great, thanks, Frain. Uh, question maybe for Ron about WIP Plus, if you heard anything. WIP, uh, WIP Plus is, is still ongoing. Uh, you could sign up any time. Uh, I'm sure FSA uh, would, would, would want you to come in and, and, uh, and get, get, get going on all the paperwork. Uh, as you know, the offices aren't taking any people, you have to do it all electronically or by mail. But yeah, I know everything is, is, is a goal there. I don't even know if they even have a deadline set on when you need to get it done, but you might as well get in there. They've got most of the information already downloaded from your crop insurance. So 
so uh, you, you can get going on it. Right, Just thanks, as, a, as a follow on to that, if I could, uh, Dave, th there's still some, um, I guess, uncertainty on how the WIT Plus program is going to make any adjustments for quality. And I know for the corn guys that might be listing, you know, light test weight corn is obviously a big issue. Uh, crop insurance and the, and the discount factors they use within the crop insurance program really doesn't follow what happened in the marketplace very well. So the, the WIT Plus was in, did include some quality adjustment parameters. Again, I know USDA is working on that behind the scenes, trying to figure out a process and a methodology to be able to, to come up with a number that would be, be representative of the, of the loss. So we still, you, Ron is absolutely correct that, that the first step is to go in or to make sure that you have your paperwork filled out so that you identify and you raise your hand and say, yes, I'm, 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 I want to apply for the WIT Plus program. Let's check that I am, you know, whether I have qualified or not qualified, but we really don't have a very good read on what kind of payments will be received yet. So I just wanted to emphasize the, the quality adjustments for WIT Plus have, are, are still a work in progress. Thanks, Frayne. A question for Tim. Uh, should ranchers consider holding back their heifers and market them as bred heifers? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer now because we don't know what's going to happen. I would not change my marketing plans from what I had before and at least drastically and wait it out. I would not, if, if you were going to do it before and that's what you do, uh, probably okay to continue, but don't completely change a marketing plan at this time would be the best that I could say because it's, we're in unknown territory. And then, Frayne, I think there was a question about what prices are, what crops are the prices telling growers to plant? <laughs> well, if, <laughs> oh boy, talk about loaded questions, right? Yeah. Um, so if we, right now today, because the markets are closed, if we look at the relationship between November soybeans and December corn, that price relationship's at 2.5, right, right on the smack dab middle, which means that the market right now today is is not signaling farmers should there's there's no incentive to increase or decrease your corn plantings or planting intentions. Now again, I, I do think there's some folks based on the perspective plantings reports that that came out and and some some of the price adjustments now that have occurred due to COVID-19. I do think we'll see uh, the corn acres back off from the prospective plantings report. But right now today, the market is not, not signaling for farmers to change or to switch between corn and beans. Um, there is still a slight advantage for the, looking at the corn wheat ratio. Again, 1.5 is kind of considered neutral or, or typical. Right now at the close today, it's 1.56. Again, not really a strong incentive to look at additional spring wheat acres. Uh, but again, that price relationship is is signaling maybe a a weak preference for for some more corn. I mean, for more wheat relative to corn. But I'm also in the camp of uh, uh, or the perspective that Tim is bringing. Um, right now, there just doesn't seem to be enough strong enough signal from the marketplace to make any big dramatic changes in your in your planting intentions. Again, and I know a lot of the times, yes, price relationships make a difference, but this is also about um, managing your, your rotation systems, managing weed control, managing your labor requirements. And so uh, I, I guess I'm of the same belief to, with Tim that, you know, if you went into the spring, spring planting season anticipating you're going to plant a particular rate relationship or ratio of crops, I wouldn't start dramatically changing that. To tweak it here and there a little bit, fine, but I wouldn't really um, try and change anything to chase the marketplace. Great. Thanks, Frayn. Uh, any last questions? And you can enter them via chat. You can also use the, the question and answer tool. Um, as we're getting closer to the end, to just remind everybody that we do have three quick questions. Uh, if you can go to the URL on the screen, uh, really helpful. It'll let us know uh, how we're doing and, and what we can cover in the future. And then, as I mentioned, uh, a recording of this and previous uh, webinars is available at the two websites uh, on your screen. So oh, Dave, just, Dave, there was yeah. just really quick one question that I did want to try and address. It was uh, uh, coming back to the, the, those charting techniques about the oversold versus overbought. 
Um, and, and the question was, is that relative to like our grain stocks or, is that, or, or what's going on there? And no, the, the, the relationships or that oversought, overbought versus oversold discussion or that terminology really refers to um, the, the buying pressure versus the selling pressure in the marketplace. So, you know, what is the, um, the, the number of sellers and the price levels that sellers want to, to receive versus the price level and kind of the, the amount of buying interest there is in the marketplace. So it's, it's much more about the number of buyers and sellers and how, how interested they are at pricing at different levels. Uh, it really has nothing to do with the underlying supply demand conditions. So I just wanted to clear that, that up to make sure everybody understood. Thanks, Rain. Uh, another question came up. How do you apply for IDLE? Okay, that would be at, uh, at either the SBA office or talk to a lender that handles SBA loans and they can put you in the right direction. Okay. And, and another question is, how do you define small lenders for PPP? Okay, I was trying to, I, I saw that question in the chat. I tried to, I was trying to look it up in the, in the language of the, of, the, uh, of the law here, trying to read the legalese, but it appears that um, of that 60 billion, 30 billion was supposed to go to lenders that were between 10 and 50 billion dollars in assets and the another third the other 30 billion was supposed to go to lenders that are, are less than 10 billion in assets so the, the, the even smaller lenders great thanks Ron. and one question for all the panelists after hearing the other remarks remarks from the other panelists do you have any comments or anything that you want to add Well, if not, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon, uh, given uh, ongoing discussion and, and the, the turbulent situation. I'm sure that we'll be meeting again next week. Uh, again, if you have any questions for us, uh, feel free to, to reach us via other channels. Uh, we will have a recording uh, of this webinar up, and we'd ask that you provide uh, feedback on, with the URL on the screen. Thanks, everybody.